bit about Microsoft domain quirks and how they can be exploited. About this, Yakuto will tell us now. So, uh, hello everyone, welcome to my talk, which is called uh, Domain Computers Have Accounts Too. And in this talk, we will uh, abuse domain accounts to actually be able to own some machines through relaying and delegation. And we will be abusing some old quirks, some new quirks, and I hope we will have a lot of fun. Now, uh, I want to start by uh, uh, having a shout out to some guys who um, basically did all the hard work of figuring out uh, ways to abuse machine accounts. Uh, I want to mention uh, specifically these people, which is Lee Christensen, Will Schroeder, Matt Nelson, and Elad Shamir and Durgan. But there are a lot of others that basically over the years spend a lot of time digging into the Active Directory and Microsoft domains. So everybody else who paved way for this research, uh, you did a great job. And I also want to thank my employer because it's nice to be able to do your own research without having to worry about paying the rent. Uh, so we will start with a very old technology that's uh, part of Microsoft Active Directory, and that's uh, NTLM. NTLM stands for New Technology Land Manager, and the NT means uh, it was introduced in Windows NT 4.0, which uh, it was introduced in 1996, which incidentally, the protocols are older than I am, so it's a pretty ancient stuff. Now, NTLM is a suite of protocols for security because there, there's a lot of terminology, uh, a lot of confusing terminology when it comes to NTLM, and uh, we will call NTLM the whole package of different protocols that are used for basically everything you need to be able to uh, communicate on the network securely. So, um, challenge response, authentication protocols, uh, signing protocols, uh, the whole package. And NTLM is best known for what's often called the NTLM hash, which is a hash of the user password. And basically, everybody who used uh, Mimikatz probably dumped their own NTLM hash of the password. And there's a lot of talk about uh, pass the hash attacks. But we will not talk about those, because uh, for this talk, the, the most important thing from NTLM is the challenge response protocol. So uh, the way challenge response protocols work in general is that there is a shared secret between the client and the server. So there is something both of them know, and therefore uh, both of them can do a calculation based on some random challenge, and both of them will get the same results if they really know the, sh the same secret. So the way it works, uh, as can be seen from this, from this diagram, is that when the client wants to authenticate to the server, uh, the server sends back a random 32-bit number in this case, which is the server challenge, and both of them uh, calculate, uh, do the same calculation with the shared secret, which in this case is the hash of the user's password, and uh, Hopefully, they will come to the same result. So then the client sends the answer to the challenge to the server, and the server can verify it. And uh, in version 2, there is also a voluntary uh, client challenge step. So also, uh, not only the server can be sure that the client knows the secret, but also the client can verify that the server knows the secret as well. Now, throughout this presentation, I will have some uh, footnotes. Uh, I, uh, these are things that I think are interesting but are uh, out of the scope for this talk. So it's uh, more like something that you can later check out when you uh, check the slide deck or read if, uh, if I'm talking about something you already know. So now the thing about uh, challenge response protocols is that there's, uh, they are often uh, vulnerable to what's called a relaying, re relaying attack. And uh, net in NTLM is unfortunately no different. Uh, so how does Relink work? Uh, what's important from this diagram is that, uh, as you can see, the first thing that actually happens is that the client attempts to uh, authenticate to the attacker, which is uh, the, the skull in the middle. So uh, the client goes to the attacker and says, I want to authenticate to you using net NTLM. And the attacker, instead of generating a random challenge, instead, asks 
for, a for the challenge, a server, it basically wants to authenticate to without knowing the shared secret. And so it gets its own server challenge, a random one, and then it just forwards it to the client, using it as an oracle for calculating responses to, to the challenge. So the client, as it wanted to connect to the attacker, it will uh, hap happily comply, it will uh, calculate the answer to the challenge, send it to the attacker, and the attacker can then forward it to the server. Now, uh, obviously, it can completely, even if there is a random client challenge, it can completely ignore it. It's, we as an attacker don't care whether the server really knows the, 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 the secret. We just want to authenticate, and we can just happily kill the connection with the client and said something went wrong, we are connection reset. But, so the two important things to take from this diagram about relaying is that uh, in this scenario, the attacker has absolutely no knowledge of, of the shared secret. Uh, I mean, if the, if the, if the challenge, uh, challenge response calculation is, is vulnerable to, for example, brute forcing, he can try to, to force uh, brute force uh, the, the secret. But um, uh, this, this attack by itself doesn't uh, give the attacker any knowledge about the secret. And the other important thing is that, uh, as I said earlier, the client has to initiate the connection, so, or we have to have uh, another way of forcing the client to connect to us. Now, because this is a pretty big deal and it's been known for, for quite a while, uh, there is actually a mitigation in NET and TLM, and uh, that is that uh, apart from just being used to uh, prove that you have uh, knowledge of, uh, of a shared secret, uh, NET and TLM can also derive a session key from the shared secret. So, as I said earlier, because the attacker doesn't know the shared secret, he can't calculate the session key. There's no way he can guess it from the, uh, from the challenge response protocol. And when signing is enforced or signing is negotiated between the two sides, ev every message going through must be signed with that session key. So you can relay authentication. It will work. It will go through fine. But after that, you can't basically create your own messages or even tamper with, me tamper with messages coming from the client because you, have, uh, you don't have any knowledge of the session key and therefore you can sign, uh, you can sign any messages. Uh, however, the uh, interesting quirk is that not all protocols are support, uh, support signing, so you can't force signing for all protocols. Uh, the most uh, common protocols that are used with NTLM authentication, which is SMB and uh, LDAP, which is used for uh, accessing the basically the Active Directory, the, the properties of objects and user accounts, etc. They do support signing, but HTTP doesn't at all. So if you somehow uh, force a client to try to connect to you over HTTP and authenticate using net NTLM, you can be sure that it won't ever ask for signing because uh, it doesn't even attempt to ask for signing over HTTP. And uh, another interesting thing about this is uh, the first message that's actually sent, uh, which is the negotiation message, the NTLM SSP negotiate. Uh, contains a bit mask of requested security features. It's uh, the way how the client and server agree on how strong encryption they will use, etc. So it can, for example, say, I don't want to do signing ever, or I want to do signing if you can, or I need signing, don't even bother uh, answering if you don't support it, and willingness to use the first version of uh, Net NetNTLM, which is way weaker than the version 2. Uh, and the important thing is this message contains uh, again, a signature, signature uh, again based on the shared secret called the uh, uh, MIC, the message integrity code, and therefore cannot be easily tempered. And uh, again, say for implementation bugs, because uh, there was uh, um, recently there was a drop the mic uh, vulnerability that basically allowed you to uh, completely throw away the message integrity code, but that was a bug and was promptly fixed, so um, it shouldn't be possible which means you can't easily downgrade a request for signing, not only, uh, not only when the signing is uh, enforced, but for example, if for SMB, you just have a client that says, hey, if you can do signing, do it, please, then you can, just, you can only relay this message completely, even with this bit set, uh, and therefore, if also the server can do, can do signing, they will negotiate it even when you are uh, man in the middle in their connection. So um, even if... Uh, even if the you know, signing is only requested, you are basically screwed and can, can't communicate easily, which is, again, why uh, 
why the fact that HTTP doesn't support signing is so important for us, because it gives us a primitive that allows us to relay easily without having to worry about negotiation signing. And so now, uh, this was a primer on NTLM and NTLM relaying. And now let's get the to the title of the talk, which is Domain Computers Have Accounts Too. And actually, every machine that's joined to a domain has its own account in Active Directory. Uh, so I will, the, again, the terminology is kind of kind of awkward here, but I will be using uh, account to actually refer to, uh, to uh, an item that's actually in the Active Directory, and I will be uh, using uh, user accounts for accounts that are actually for users and machine accounts for accounts that are actually representing machines. And the way you can recognize these, uh, these accounts is that uh, the name of the account always ends with a dollar. So for example, if you have a desktop 8K CGBF6 uh, registered in the domain, it will have an account uh, with this name with the dollar sign uh, at the end. Now. There are not many differences between user accounts and machine accounts. Uh, the most important difference is that the uh, machine accounts have uh, very long, I think it's like 32 characters, randomly generated passwords, which can even contain invalid UTF-16 characters. So it's basically uh, 64 bytes random. Uh, or maybe 32 bytes, uh, I'm not really sure here, but the point is it's, it's too long to brute force, so uh, guessing machine uh, account passwords is basically impossible. But apart from that, it can do the, all the things that uh, regular accounts can do, so it can authenticate using NTLM, it can get Kerberos tickets, which we will talk about in a minute, and it can be a victim of NTLM relaying, so it can be a victim of the attack I showed uh, before. So the big question is, can we own a computer by relaying its machine credentials? Let's say we have a way of uh, asking, uh, of forcing the computer to authenticate to us using its machine credentials, and we can relay it somewhere. Where do we relay it to own the computer? Is there even such a way? And this was an open question for a long time, and just recently in uh, last year and this year, we started to uh, see some answers for it. And to be able to answer this question, we have to look at another authentication or uh, or another uh, security protocol that's used on Microsoft domains, and that is uh, Kerberos. Now, Kerberos is, uh, is uh, 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 a protocol for distribution of symmetric keys, so it's it's, it's a very complex beast, basically. It was designed by, uh, in MIT, and then Microsoft added a lot of its own stuff to it. And it's, it's a very complex beast, so uh, this is basically the topic that I will be simplifying the most. And we will not care about uh, distributing any keys, etc. We will just care about the authentication factor of this, uh, of this protocol. And so bear with me as I try to explain the, the basics, and I hope I will not end up like Swift on. Swift on security. So the first thing uh, that you need to know about is what a TGT is. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a mouthful. It's a ticket granting ticket. And it's basically a proof that you authenticate it, that you can later use to request tickets for, uh, for services. So uh, the favorite InfoSec analogy here is an analogy with an amusement, amusement park. So if you come to an amusement park and ask for, uh, for a ticket for the whole day, for you know, for all the attractions, you can basically buy it, and this is what, uh, what is your TGT. And later, when you want to get, for example, coins for bumper cars or something, you just go to the booth, present your, uh, your whole day ticket, and they will give you coins uh, for the car ride, which is the ticket for the, for the, uh, for the service. So, and basically, why you want to use a TGT is that you can only once authenticate using your password or using your password hash, etc. And then you have this ticket that doesn't have any relation to the user's password that you can just go around and pass to everybody. And your identity only needs to be checked once. So you only need to authenticate once, and all the other steps can be authorization. So only can, can this user access this, not is it really that user. So the way of getting a TGT is uh, very simple. You just ask for a TGT. Uh, the Kerberos distribution center says that you need to pre-authenticate. Uh, so you, again, send, uh, send another request, this time uh, sending a password hash or a key or something that basically can prove who you are, and you get your TGT. Now, the other part of Kerberos after you have a TGT are services. 
And don't think about services as in Windows services, which, again, the terminology sucks, but uh, think about uh, different protocols. So for example, LDAP is, an service, is a service, HTTP is a service, SIFS, which is uh, another name for SMB file sharing, is a service. And every such service has uh, an SPN, or a service principal name, which is basically a unique identifier used in the domain for, for, uh, for, this, for this particular service that you want to authenticate to. So some examples of SPNs are ldap dcdomaincom which is the LDAP service on the domain controller, or uh, files.domain.com, which is basically a, a file sharing service on a file sharing server. So, now, when you already have a TGD, authenticated to a service is simple. You just go to the Kerberos distribution center, ask for a ticket for, for example, sif slash fastdomain.com, prove yourself with the TGT, and the Kerberos distribution center uh, checks your TGT that is basically correct and gives you back a ticket that you can use to authenticate to the, uh, to the server, to the fastdomain.com server. Uh, as I said earlier, as Kerberos is more like a key distribution uh, protocol, you also, apart from the of the authentication part, you also get the key that you are supposed to use to encrypt the communication, but, but that's not important for this talk. So uh, one thing that uh, is common to all complex and uh, mature, or I don't know how you want to call it, uh, protocols that uh, take care of authentication is that they often want to uh, provide some way of uh, delegation or impersonation, so uh, some, some primitive that allows you to pretend to be someone you really are not. And this is useful, they say it is useful for single sign-on, uh, uh, for single sign-on, so for example, when you connect to a server and that server wants to, uh, for example, connect to a backup server and then it can use your credentials, so, so it seems like uh, if you directly uh, connected to it and all of, the, all of the authorization, all of the uh, ACLs you have set up, basically, uh, basically work, and so uh, it's, it's something that uh, these protocols often do. And Kerberos, or at least the Microsoft implementation of Kerberos, is no different. And the most powerful delegation is so-called unconstrained delegation. It even had it in its name. And what it basically means that uh, if you set up a service or set up a machine, uh, therefore all services on that machine, for unconstrained delegation, it means that every ticket that uh, the KDC uh, generates for, for this machine contains the TGT of the, of the original user uh, such that the service can decrypt it. Therefore, once you, you actually give this ticket, pass this ticket to, to the server you want to connect to, it can decrypt it and it can do everything it uh, would be able to do as if it authenticated with a password. It basically has the, the master ticket, the ticket gunting ticket, it basically has a copy of your, of your uh, proof that, of your proof of who you are. However, and this is very sensible, is that by default, this is something only domain administrator can set up, because basically, when, when you compromise a host that uh, has uh, unconstrained delegation allowed, uh, every time you get somebody to, uh, to uh, authenticate to you, you basically stall the credentials, or basically you can go around and s tell everybody that uh, I am domain administrator and, and they will believe you. So uh, I, again, prepared a small diagram how it works. It's uh, almost the same as getting regular tickets, but this time the KDC actually uh, includes the TGT in the response. Uh, but as it's uh, encrypted with a key of the target, uh, you as a client can't really tell whether, it's, uh, whether the uh, TGT is in it or isn't, uh, isn't in it. You just pass it to the server and it can see, oh, he gave me a TGT, that's nice. Uh, and this is very powerful, but also very dangerous, because basically when you trust somebody for a constant delegation, they can go around your domain and uh, pretend to be uh, anybody to uh, everyone else. So Microsoft introduced what they call cons constraint delegation, or as for you to proxy. And uh, this time, actually, the trust is not like a global whole domain thing, but the trust is set up between two, two services. Uh, actually, in the Microsoft implementation, it's most often set between two machines, uh, which basically means that if PCA trusts PCB, then every service on PCA trusts every service on PCB. And uh, it works very similarly, but this time there's no TGT passing, because if you pass your TGT to somebody, there's no way um, anybody can limit you on what you can do. But this time, if the trusted service gets a forwardable ticket that actually authenticates user for 
the, for the trusted service, it can, it can ask the KDC to turn it into a ticket, authenticate it the same user, but for the trustee machine. So in the example we had before, when a user uh, sends a ticket to um, SIFS at PCB, the service can take this ticket, use it as a proof that uh, the user actually accessed it, go to the KD KDC and get the ticket for, uh, for LDAP at PCA, which basically trusts uh, all tickets from PCB. Uh, the way it, were, uh, it looks like in, in, in a diagram is that, yeah, the ticket exchange is the same as always, but now uh, let's pretend that, for example, FizerDomain.com uh, has, has, a, has a service that uh, basically allows you to get an older, older version of the file, and it wants to preserve all ACLs, etc. So the backup.domain.com trusts all tickets from FizerDomain.com. So the files then says, I have this ticket that authorizes user to access me. Please give me a ticket that uh, authorizes the same user to access the backup server. And as, as the constraint delegation is set up, uh, the KDC basically says, yeah, it's fine. OK, here is your ticket. And the fast.domain.com can go to the backup.domain.com and uh, basically pretend to be you. And uh, so with constraint delegation, originally, we had the same limitation as with the unconstrained delegation. It was just way more granular. And that is, the, and only domain administrator can set it. And the old way of setting it up was that it was set on the trusted machine side. However, uh, I, I don't know when, but recently, maybe 2016 or something like that, Microsoft added a so-called resource-based constraint delegation which means that uh, the trustee can now set constraint delegation for itself. So if I am a, a victim machine, I can basically go to the loadup server and say, hey, I want to trust all tickets that come from the attacker machine. And this is the important primitive that we will be using to, to be able to turn relaying of machine accounts into something useful. Because once we are able to relay the authentication of the victim machine account to the, to the domain controller, we can Basically, then uh, we can basically then set it to trust any other computer in the domain. And there's still a piece missing, which is actually a funny quirk that uh, uh, at the first si side looks innocent, but will, will basically allow us to do anything we want. It's that there's another another. It's not delegation as much as it is a way to to basically do protocol transition, which. Uh, what basically it means is that often when you are a service or you are a machine and you have a ticket that, for example, uh, authenticates to, to Samba or something, you can just uh, create a, a ticket for the user for any other services you offer from FinAir. So basically the way it works is that when you are, when you are a service, you can always come to the, to, uh, go to the KDC and say, hi, I want to create a ticket that authenticates administrator uh, to myself. And what's more, what's more important for us, is this, these tickets work as proof for as for you to proxy. So you can basically take this ticket that you generated out of thin air without any credentials, without any password, and say, turn this into a ticket to another machine that trusts me, and it works. So this brings us to our plan of attack. So the plan of attack is we own any domain join machine because we need uh, somebody who can actually use the s for you to self to, to create tickets out of thin air. So we own a machine that has any service, which is basically any machine. And then we uh, find the victim machine, get it to authenticate to us using NTLM, relay this uh, authentication that it sent us to LDAP and use it to configure so that the victim trusts all tickets that come from the attacker. And now as we own the, own the attacker, we can just get the TGT for the attacker dollar account, the, the machine account. We can use s for you to self to generate an administrator that allows for, uh, for the attacker machine to that uh, authenticates administrator to the attack machine, and then we can again go to the KDC and use s for you to proxy to turn this into an administrator ticket for the victim. So a single relay, and we have basically uh, uh, we we can authenticate as an administrator to any victim machine. Now I talked about the last four four points uh, pretty thoroughly, so I want to focus now on the first two points. So how can we own any domain joint machine? Now. 
there is a there is a funny thing in the Active Directory is that by default all accounts and even machine accounts can up up to five machines to the domain with just their credentials. So I mean every sensible administrator disable this. I, I have yet to see a production domain that actually has this still enabled. But if you find a domain with this enabled, you can just go to the domain controller, ask it to uh, add the machine, and it will happily do it. And um, it's everything you need. But uh, uh, and the funny thing is that, as I said, even machine accounts can add machines, and these machine, ac machine accounts can then add machines. So uh, if you are very clever, you can basically skip the first step, and when you are in the first, third step and you are relaying the victim credentials to LDAP, you can use LDAP to first create the attacker dollar machine, generate a new one, and then set the trusting. So you can do just one relaying and basically create a machine and set it as trusted. Uh, and the other way is like the old ways. So you find a, an old Windows server that is vulnerable to Eternal Blue, or you, for example, uh, boot, boot Kali on a provided workstation and steal its credentials uh, as long as it's not uh, as long as it's not encrypted with BitLocker. Uh, now, so these all these steps were pretty easy, and uh, pretty often they are they are achievable. But the hard part that remains is getting authentication from machines, which is, which is the part where we still need more powerful primitives. So if you have any idea how to do this, you can uh, basically uh, you can tell us and we'll be happy. Because uh, right now, uh, the best, way we have, best ways we have are uh, men in the middle attacks, which are kind of quirky. So the, the best one that always so far worked for me is uh, physical men in the middle where you literally take the machine when you have physical access to it and reconnect it to your computer, which runs a DHCP server, tells it you're the DNS server, and resolves every, every single address to your, to, to your attacker computer. And once you reboot the machine, Windows eventually tries to download something. Uh, most often, I've seen uh, um, some Windows update certificates, which for some reason, it thinks it's a good idea to download using HTTP, and authenticates using machine credentials as after the reboot, there are no other credentials to use so far, so it will happily authenticate using them. Uh, another way of achieving a man in the middle position in this way is uh, actually remotely, not physically, is uh, MIT M6, which is an interesting project where if the network where you are doesn't have IPv6 setup at all, you can basically uh, most of the Windows machines are set up so they still try to look for uh, IPv6 DHCP servers. So you can just start your own DHCP6 servers and again uh, tell everybody your the DNS server as, and as Windows prefers IPv6 over IPv4, they will uh, use you. They will probably use you instead of the IPv4 DNS server that is actually that is actually meant to be used in the domain. Uh, there are also some funny and weird uh, primitives for getting authentication from machines. One of them is changing your lock screen or profile picture, because for some reason, uh, when, you, when you change a profile picture, it's actually downloaded, uh, downloaded using the machine account. And there is a protocol called DAF, which is basically file access over HTTP. So it's re reliable. Reliably reliable, if you know what I mean. And um, so you, you can just send, ch change your lock screen to uh, something like webdaf relay at 80 slash folder slash dummy JPEG. And again, the machine will try to authenticate it, authenticate to your webdaf relay, and you can then relay the credentials. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, is also, I think, pretty interesting, and it's the printer bug, where bug is in quotes because Microsoft says that it's by design and it's a feature. Uh, it's this, there's a, this mouthful remote procedure call called RPC Remote Find First Printer Change Notification X. And uh, what this does is basically it asks the computer to register yourself as, uh, re register some other server as a notification listener. So if anything changes about any printer, it will send you a message and tell you, for example, this printer is out of paper. Now, as this works over, uh, as this notification, um, as this notification goes over SMB, it basically means that when you register yourself uh, on a remote machine as a notification handler, it will try to connect with you uh, uh, with you over SMB using the machine account. So, so yeah, if I register my attacker machine as a notification receiver, I will get an SMB connection. Now, most configurations at least ask for signing in the negotiation, so it's usually not reliable to LDAP as uh, re reliable, reliable, 
reliable to LDAP, which uh, supports signing. So when the machine asks for it, then the LDAP will happily want to sign messages, and you will not be able to able to uh, craft your own messages. Now, I, I've been looking into the available exploits, and they basically do two calls. They do open printer, and then do the uh, change notification regis uh, uh, registration. And uh, the open printer is basically you need to get a handle first before you can do uh, the other calls. And what it does is that it opens the target machine as, as the printer, not, not your listener, which is kind of confusing. But basically, the way it works is that if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, get an authentication from a victim, you connect to the victim, you open printer the victim, and then you register as a change notification your own computer, your attacker computer. And I've been reading the RPRN protocol docs, and I found something interesting, which is the, the, the printer name that the open printer accepts is actually defined as follows where not only you have the regular thing you would expect is server name and local printer name, but there's also apparently something called a web print server that works over HTTP. So I was like, yeah, HTTP is better over SMB. I wonder what happens if I change the open printer from self to uh, attacker slash printer slash random slash dot printer. And I've started uh, my relaying software, and this is basically the log that uh, it output it. I'm sorry for the censorship, but I wanted this to be authentic. So uh, this is really the first time I saw it. And what I saw here is I skipped through two lines, and I saw like, hey, it received a con HTTP connection, and then it tried to, here is the authentication as the, as, the, as the machine account. So I was like, hey, it's authenticating over HTTP as the machine account. The relay failed for some reason, but this is huge. So I registered a talk at a CCC camp, but it turns out Last week, I was trying to reproduce this like crazy, over and over, but couldn't. And turns out what really happened is that these two lines I black out here are really what's important, and that, uh, that the connection actually came from, uh, that, the, that the credentials actually came over SMB, not over HTTP. So what happened? I spent a lot of time debugging this, and it turns out yeah, I was just quickly hacking, and I left the call to the change notification registration unmodified. So the remote machine really connected over HTTP in the open printer, uh, in the open printer call, but it didn't send any meaningful credentials over that. It basically authenticated as a null user with a null password, which is not really useful. But after that, as I didn't change the printer change notification registration at all, it did the, the known, the exploiting regular SMB call, and it sent over its credentials, and that's what I saw in the log. So as it was multi-threaded, I wasn't able to, to connect uh, it with either the HTTP or the SMB connection. So unfortunately, this looks to be uh, like a dead end and that we don't have a remote attack that can actually uh, make machines authenticated to us using HTTP. So uh, this all sounds great and theoretical, but I actually have a demo for this. So uh, hopefully, if the demo gods uh, approve of this, we will uh, first abuse the adding a machine. We will then use the physical man in the middle to uh, get the victim to authenticate to our Kali machine. And we will relay these credentials, use them to configure to trust the uh, machine we just added to the domain, and then do the whole uh, impersonation delegation attack. So. What I have here is a victim machine, which is uh, called desktop 83 BNFM. Yeah, I know it's a weird name, but we'll do. And I have a Kali machine that has two network cards. One of them is connected to the domain, and one of them is actually where I've set up the, uh, where I set up the DHCP to uh, give IP addresses and to say I'm the router and I'm the domain name server. So first, what I want to do is uh, at the computer, as I've said, so I can just uh, use uh, credentials. Uh, imagine that I'm, for example, in a pen test, so I have an unprivileged account to log into the, to the domain machine, to the, to the DC. So I just say, I want to add a, add a random computer. And it happily, because it's enabled, it happily created a random desktop machine with, uh, with this password, which, yeah. So I, so, I, so I now have a machine in the domain. So what I want to do next is set up uh, the DNS server. I will use a responder for that. Um, I only run it as, as a uh, DNS server, so all the SMB and HTTP servers are turned off. And also, I will start up the, uh, the NTLM Relay X, where I say I want, to, uh, I want to relay to LDAP on the domain computer. Uh, 
I want to and I want to delegate access to the and here I need to type the uh, the machine I just edit. So I want to delegate uh, access to this one. So now I just do what I said I will do. I uh, reconnect the uh, machine to the network where I have set up my DHCP server, and I reboot. Now there are already some, as you can see, there are some already some Windows update HTTP request, which why in 2019 uh, Windows update is happily downloading over HTTP is beyond me. But we have to wait after the reboot, so there's no other account than the machine account available. So we wait for a while in those boots. Yeah, and so now, as you can see, we already uh, successfully, it's somewhere here, we already successfully relayed these credentials as the, as the, as the target, which is the A83BN, and we, we uh, there it has already performed, so yeah. Uh, somewhere here it, it, in the log there will be, yeah, so the desktop X, XHP which we added can now successfully impersonate users on the target via S4U to proxy. So this is everything we basically need to do. So now let me just reconnect uh, the target machine back to the domain. So it sees the domain control and actually verify, uh, verify that the ticket I give it is correct. And so now there's a helpful script in Impacket that allows you to do all the TGT and as for you to self and as for you to proxy. And so I just need to do get ST, which I say, I want a ticket for SIFS, which is Samba, at the victim desktop, which is the 83 BNFM. I want to impersonate administrator. And here I basically say that I want to uh, authenticate as the machine I, I edit again, which is, uh, which is this one. And uh, this is the password for the machine. And bam, I have a ticket that actually impersonates administrator for the machine. So now I can just do a secrets dump where I just say I want to use this uh, cached ticket and uh, I don't want to authenticate using password and this is the victim. And when I now run it, nothing happens. <laughs> Yeah, this is probably some, uh, oh, I, I accidentally connected the wrong network. This needs to be on vminute 7, not vminute 8, which I will quickly fix. Numbers. And now try again. And bam, here are your credentials. So we successfully impersonate administrator to the target machine. So, yeah, this is not good. So how can we mitigate? The problem is that most of the chain is by design. It's something that's uh, in Kerberos. It that is meant to be in Kerberos that Microsoft really thinks is useful. And Microsoft would have to change that. For example, one, one thing I think would be clever is to somehow prohibit as for you to sell tickets to be uh, used as a proof for as for you to proxy. But Microsoft is currently not willing to do that. So the only real mitigation is you have now, right now is preventing relaying. So for signing for all protocols where it is available, and not only ask for it, but actually force it, and ban NTLM authorization where not available, so over HTTP. And uh, actually, uh, as I said, this is, this is very new. So last week, uh, Microsoft actually released, uh, released an advisory that recommends that you turn on LDAP sign uh, specifically to stop these attacks that were coming out, uh, uh, like, uh, that were coming out uh, um, right now. So, and one thing you can do as a defense in dev measure is that you can add critical users to, to the protected users group or at least give them user you know, delegated, which prevents uh, most of the delegation attacks. And so uh, this is the end of the presentation. As you can see, epic fails happen. Basically, the, the, the reason I registered this talk was that I thought I had an exploit that I didn't have, but such is life. Uh, 
but I'd be more than happy to talk to you later uh, here at, at the CC camp or DM me at Twitter at Yagoto, and we are still looking for new, for new ways to force remote machines to authenticate to us uh, using their machine credentials, as this is the last thing we are missing to have a really powerful, really potent attack chain. So that's it, and have you, do you have any questions? Yeah, that's right. I would say let's hear a warm round of applause for this guy. Are there any questions? We have two question angels in the middle. Um, anybody can sit up, go up. Is there a question from the internet? No. Nope. No questions from the internet. No questions from the audience. No one. You have three, two, one. Yeah, I guess let's have another warm round uh, Thank you. of applause. Thank you, Yogurtan. <laughs>